Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome back to our final session of, uh, of the day. My name is Matthew Anderson. I'm the European Culture Editor of uh, the New York Times, and this afternoon we're going to be talking about art and the climate crisis. So uh, originally the, the um, topic was conceived as public art, digital art, and the climate crisis. Unfortunately, Georgia Albertino, who was supposed to join us from the Google Cultural Institute, she won't be with us as she unfortunately has COVID at the moment. Uh, so we probably won't steer the topic so much in the direction of uh, the digital art, which is obviously a, an area of expertise um, for her. But I also don't see any need for us just to restrict ourselves to talking about public art either. I think we can have a kind of wide-ranging conversation on how the climate crisis intersects with the world of, of, of art. It's obviously one of the main ideas that we're all coming to terms with, the fact that the, uh, that the climate is changing and that manifests itself on all levels of uh, intellectual life uh, and, and the arts, of course, is, is, is one of the main places in which uh, that is manifested. So we, there have also been several big high-profile commissions uh, in recent years in which art is used as a kind of instrument of consciousness raising or it is put in a public place that asks us to think very specifically about the issue of, 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 of the climate. Uh, and I want us to think about how sort of effective that is as a way of, of asking those questions, but also maybe is that really is that the job of art to do uh, something like that? So I thought um, I'm, joy I'm, I'm lucky that we are uh, joined by Hans Ulrich Obris, the uh, director of the Serpentine Gallery, and the Brazilian artist Ernesto uh, Neto, who makes large sculptural uh, installations and whose work always, probably even from a time before we were aware of the dire state of the climate, has always invited us to ask questions about our position as humans in terms of the, uh, of the natural world. Uh, Ernesto, for, for people who aren't familiar with your practice, maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about how you work and how the issue of, um, uh, uh, of the climate manifests itself in your work. Uh, bon, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here sitting in this chair with my friend Hans and Matthew uh, that is doing a great job here. Uh, this fantastic room full of, there is some dragons I saw there and I was enjoying that. And I had been here, first place I come to Italy, uh, I think 36 years ago when I was 23, was in Florence. Uh, and I arrived here, I went to the dome, the dome was uh, easy to get in and out. It's a great dome, fantastic, this piece of church. In my, in my opinion, the best one uh, I have seen in my life. And I saw it yesterday again, and it was strong to see it uh, close to the city, né? very organic, the city is around that. So it's like there is a dance in between the city and the dome, and this big amount of people, it, it, I begin to think uh, about this time now, uh, it's like uh, 36 years, and how a lot of things had changed in the art world, in everything that is going on. So my practice is I am a sculptor, I do sculpture pretty much thinking about the body and how is to be where we are, to feel our body, because we are very much uh, attached to the, to the head, uh, in my opinion. And, and this body begin to grow. I work very much with textile. I begin to try to understand what is a textile. And I begin to do crochet to understand the knitting of it. And then from crochet, we begin to do some sculptures that we can touch the sculptures, which is quite interesting for the relation that we had with the last talk about the NFT, because touching for me is something very important to feel ourselves in the world, to pick up a glass of water and drink the water and feel this water get inside of us and, and breathe. And then we, uh, by this thing, working very much with gravity, uh, that, that, that is, from touching, uh, people begin to take their shoes and get in, you know, I like very much this idea to take our shoes to get somewhere. And I just came from Thailand, and it was uh, incredible there because there is a lot of temples, you know, in Shanghai. 
and the temples are not really big, you know. They are, they are sometimes quite small in relation to the big dome here. But everyone, before they go, get in, they take their shoes out, then they go up in a staircase where there is two serpents named Naka. And they, and they get in, normally sometimes there is a carpet there, and all of them, you know, my friends, curators and artists, everyone go in their knee and they make a, a, a blessing, a, a, a regard, I don't know, a saudação, a salute to, 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 the, to the big Buddha sitting down there, you know, with their eye closed in a position of meditation, and this was, very beautiful. So in this situation of taking their shoes, I begin to make sculptures that invite people to get in on these big bodies. Like he, uh, I was thinking very much the, 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 the possibility of getting inside of our own body because we have all these uh, visions of inside of the body and all the science that is showing our body through photographies, videos, and then uh, how is to be inside of a body. And then I begin to think, of how is to be inside of the body of Mother Nature. And it reminds when I saw the sculpture for the first time in Mexico, the Mexican sculptures at the Anthropological Museum, and I saw these sculptures being more stone, more heavy than the pure stone, you know. While in my education, I thought that the, the Egyptian wants to make the sculpture to become a kind of gas, while the Greek wanted to move and then I begin to realize that this knowledge comes from a very dry uh, uh, ambience. Ambience that's a desert or even Greece is quite dry, even though there's a lot of water, but it's very much water, uh, stones, and not so much vegetation. And they, in Yucatan, they come from a very big forest, you know? And, and then I remember that uh, uh, anthropologist Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, I he read his saying that uh, uh, for the indigenous, the world is too much populated, you know? And I realized that in Brazil, where I come from, Rio de Janeiro, there is a forest there, you know, named uh, uh, Serra do Mar, Inhorã. For the Guarani, they call Inhorã. And, uh, and so we are educated in, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, symbiosis was there, always very important to me, symbiosis, mutualism. You have a tree there, and you have a lot of ants and birds and other plants on this tree. It's a lot of happening in one tree in the middle of the forest, you know. A lot of things going on. And then, uh, we, but at the same time, our, the education I, we have, it, a kind of Western education, is education that comes from the dry land, you know, the relation between the figure and the background. In the former times of Greece, Egypt, or ever arriving here, I don't know exactly how was this mix, but from this Renaissance and everything, was very related to, to, to a very, the, the relation between the figure and the background was very empty, while there is very full of events. And now the society that we live is the society of the full. When you go out uh, and you move around uh, the dome, you see a lot of people. It's people everywhere. Here in this room is a lot of people. And then you have the NFT and you have the internet. So we really live in the time of the full. New York, London, you know, Sao Paulo. It's a lot of people uh, in the place, you know. So we are really, then our body full of, you know, we are. Uh, three billions of ourselves, cells with our DNA, and one quadrillion of uh, foreign cells, uh, bacteria. Uh, I think there was one guy who told about the museum that uh, the bacteria has an opinion there, and I think this is fantastic, you know. Uh, it's difficult to know how to deal with that, but that's what the shamans are talking about that we are missing. I mean, it seems like you're particularly talking about sort of shamanic knowledge or whatever. You're bringing ideas which come from outside Western art discourses into gallery settings or into public art works. Hans Ulrich, maybe I could bring you in on there. You have, I don't think anyone has as good an overview of what is going on in the institutions, in the biennials, in the fairs. Is that something that you see as a trend or as a, a, a tendency across the arts that people are in the face of a, of a climate crisis which has perhaps been caused by science, technology, economic advancement, people are increasingly turning away to other systems of thought and other types of knowledge? Yeah, thank you, Matthew, and thanks to Art for Tomorrow. It's great to be back at this uh, wonderful conference. <clears throat> I think 
that in a way there are really major shifts happening. Uh, one of the shifts, I think, I mean, it started already 15 years ago that Gustav Metzger came every day, the legendary Gustav Metzger, the late Gustav Metzger, came every day in London to our office, and he said, you know, we have to address the extinction crisis. And really out of that grew the Serpentine's work by working with artists uh, on that. And uh, of course, in a way, the question is also, how can we go beyond the short-termism? I think it's interesting, Roman Kachanik wrote this book, How to Be a Good Ancestor, and he sort of says that we need to somehow liberate ourselves from short-termism and think about a longer durational dimension, not a long durée, as Baudet would say, a longer durational dimension. And I think that means, of course, also that in, and not only in the art world, I think in all the creative fields that we need to think about new formats. And, you know, when I visit studios and more and more artists are actually less interested in exhibitions, but more interested in gardens, or maybe even in farms. I mean, it's an interesting moment at the moment. Ian Kashonivare, as an artist, started a farm in Nigeria. Autobong Nakanga is starting a farm in Italy. You have Gianfranco Barucel, who has done that you know, since the 70s. I think that that uh, means a lot, you know, in a way, in terms of what we need to take that into consideration, these, these long durational formats. I think the other thing, we've just, uh, of course, it's back to Earth at the Serpentine over the last couple of years, tried to address that. And one example is a film um, by Mantia Diawara. And it's a very fascinating story where the uh, Mali-born artist and filmmaker Mantia Diawara, who moved to Senegal, is basically working on a film where he works in a community in Senegal which used to be a fishing community. But because of the extinction, there is no more fish. And now the community basically survives by collecting pebbles. But the collecting of the pebbles creates further environmental damage. So basically, Mantia moved into this community, lives in a house there. And not only does he do a film, but he actually works with the community to find other economies so that they no longer have to you know, collect the pebbles. And I was kind of, thought it was very interesting, so many wonderful things Amos Gita I said you know, um, about an hour ago here on stage about, about art and what art can be. And I think he said something that you know, it cannot be fast. We can't change reality immediately. So I think that idea also of a new slowness. That, that was also a quote which, uh, which interested me as well, the idea that art doesn't change reality. But I think in terms of, say, in terms of commissions, which are for public artworks, which are specifically to ask us to think about something or to change our mind, that's, a, in a way, almost a kind of a didactic use of, of art in terms of asking us to yeah, to, to, to see reality a different way as a, um, as a result of it. But I mean, Hans Ulrich, what do you think in terms of being a successful artwork as well as a, um, a successful contribution to the debate about climate, that artists need perhaps to stand back from being didactic or from telling people that they should be changing their behavior or from, from doing something in particular? Yeah, I think the idea that the artwork in that sense is open uh, is, is important and there can always be, you know, many readings of it. But I think, in a way, uh, what art can really do, also in relation to the environment, became clear to me actually last year when on the island um, of, um, actually, um, when, when on the island of San Giacomo with Patricia Sandretore Baudengo, you know, we organized this performance of a young Brazilian artist who is also a friend of Ernesto called Jota Mombasa, no? And Jota Mombasa created an experience which for the few hundred people who were present there um, was completely transformative because basically um, it's called the tired watering and the artist created an imagery of thinking, you know? The, the floods are coming, an imagery of thinking. Uh, and that was really a way of rehearsing the end of the world. It was an emotional release, no? um, which created a, an incredibly inclusive planetary you know, sensitivity. And I think everybody took something else away from it. It wasn't didactic at all, but it was an incredible experience. Um. Uh, uh, Ernesto, what, in terms of your, when you are, as, as an artist, when you're making, what, say for instance, the commission that you took in uh, Qatar for the public um, artwork, how did you approach that knowing that it was meant to be seen by a large public and that there was a specific intention behind it, that it was specifically asking people to think on a particular topic? How does that then guide your practice as an artist? Yeah, uh, in the piece from Qatar? Yeah. Uh, Slug Turtle. Uh, so Slug Turtle is a piece in the desert and it's very far, it's quite close to, to, 
to the piece of Olafur, but there is no much sign, so it's kind of kind of a little bit hidden, even though it's near the 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 Hermitage uh, there. And it's a piece. It's a it's a structure, a structure as it was some goal posts, like making a octagonal, and from that place there is a kind of skin, you know. And this skin is the body of this slug turtle who has a kind of head facing a tree. This tree is a tree. The desert there is very. It's incredible. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's not this desert like dunes, you know, but it's a flat desert. There is some kind of plants that is kind of there is some dishes upside down, and these plants get out from a center, going radius to the side, and they are quite strong uh, body, full of uh, thorns, you know, and then there is some bushes out full of thorns, and there is this tree, this tree is a tree that goes up like that and make if, he, if it leaves, goes and make a kind of a, a cabana uh, that he stays, for example, from that chair to the end there and you can open, you open it because it goes all the way to the flare, to the ground. You can open it and get in there and you can sit there, they use the, 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 the farmers, the, the shippers, the guy who, who take care of the ships. Uh, they used to take a rest there, you know, so it's really incredible, this tree. So this sculpture is facing this tree, and in the center of this sculpture, there is the, the sphere, a sphere that is the re representation of the um, planet Earth, no, our planet, uh, made in a, in a Oficina Brennan, from a, a great artist from Recife who had worked very much with ceramic, he's already passed away. This oficina is becoming a cultural center too. In fact, I'm gonna have an exhibition there in the end of this year, in, in middle middle your uh, autumn. And there is some cracks on it, you know. And so the idea was that you have this this sphere, uh, very dense, made by this old uh, clay tradition. And in, in, the, in the surface of the earth, so we have the earth and the image of the earth and these sittings around, we can sit down there, give our hands, dance. And at some point when we were uh, uh, putting it up, we have the sun going down there, the moon going up here, the sphere earth here. So there is this kind of, uh, it's a place to pray, you know, a place to dance, a place to sing. Uh, for this earth, for this beautiful planet that we are, that is really much incredible, and we are here, and we don't know exactly what we are doing with this planet, because there is a kind of, uh, 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 we, become, it, we become uncomfortable with ourselves. You know? Because, for example, one year, um, I don't know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we didn't need a telephone. Now we cannot live without that. And this is becoming more and more, you know, it's something that is very interesting. It's like a Narcissus lake, you know, we look here, we are fascinated to that, but we don't know how to get out of that because we are becoming more and more dependent on it. When on reality, we are not so dependent on it. You know, we can live without that, but who can live without that now? I honestly, I can't. If I change my life completely, I can, but in this world that I live, you need to have a cell phone. You know? I'm sorry, you've done interesting work at the uh, Serpentine with public art, which actually interacts with the, the phone as well in a kind of um, augmented reality uh, kind of sense. Why don't you tell us about, and some of that no, has also had a kind of climate uh, overtone to it, no? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's actually, even if you don't focus that much on technology today, I think it is interesting to address it, no? because in a way, there's a great possibility of consciousness raising actually through, through the use of technology, how actually digital technology can in a way foster attention no? to the natural world. And we did that, for example, with Jakob Knut Stinson, who created um, a deep forest, and that was actually in Kensington Gardens. The Serpentine Gallery is in London, uh, is in Kensington Gardens, and of course the AR piece wasn't limited just to the gallery, it became the entire park. 
Um, and uh, yeah, there was a real narrative there about an ecological future which people could experience uh, with the phone. Another example would be, and it's often you know mixed reality. I think it's it, it often works which are both analog, physical, but also digital. So for example, we invited also Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. That's an example for you know an artist who wanted to do a garden rather than an exhibition. So we invited Alexandra to do a pollinator garden in Kensington Garden, and that was AI assisted. So basically with an AI help, uh, Alexander Daisy Winsberg created a garden from the perspective of the pollinators. So this is really what is useful for pollinators. Um, uh, it's, it's for the bees and for other pollinators, uh, and can then, of course, also be seen, you know, by all of us in in the park. So that would be another another example. And then, of course, there is video games. I mean, I think it's really interesting. Last year, for the first time, um, a third of the world population played video games, and that makes video games bigger than the field of music and cinema combined. Um, and of course, it's a moment where more and more artists use that medium of the video game. And again, to come back to Brazil, Brazil has this young generation around Gabriel Massan, um, and we're working actually with Gabriel on a video game which is exploring a uh, black indigenous Brazilian experience. Um, and of course, if you think about environment um, and ecology, you know, the possibility also for artists to do something with you know, mainstream games is a possibility to reach 100 or 150 million people. I mean, we did a project with Fortnite and the Cute last year, you know, and it reached in two weeks on the landing page 150 million people. So there's a huge potential there um, to, you know, to just uh, reach out, I would say. So lots of different projects, but often mixed reality. Yeah. Uh, we've got time for a question or two from the floor, if there are any. No, but if not, I want to ask you, um, Hans Ulrich, we've been talking a lot about how the climate affects the content of the arts, but as someone who leads an institution, um, I think there's a growing awareness that, uh, that the way that art museums, institutions run is also itself kind of quite polluting, carbon intensive, and that we can't, it's not good enough just to put on programs which talk about the climate, but also that we need to take actions in terms of how we run our institutions and, uh, and, and organize them. And I wondered if you could say a bit about how that is, is affecting your thinking at the Serpentine. No, thank you for that question. And of course, Andreas ra you know, raised it also earlier today. It's a you know, big carbon footprint of, of museum spaces, which has to be reduced. And I think there are many different steps you know, we, are, we are taking. First of all, of course, as always, it comes out of collaboration with artists. So at the moment, we are working with Thomas Saraceno on a project where Thomas will switch off the air conditioning for the summer. Uh, for, so this summer from you know, June to October, there won't be air conditioning during his exhibition. He's also positioning actually a, so a series of solar panels on the roof. Um, and the videos will only work you know, through that. So the solar energy will empower the videos. Of course, another really important aspect is, to, is not to always you know, throw out walls. This idea of building walls and then destroying them is also not sustainable. So the idea of recycling and upcycling previous exhibition designs is a great potential that artists can actually react to previous designs and you know, recycle them and uh, create something new. I would say another aspect is, of course, also to keep exhibitions longer. Uh, I mean, there is no reason one would set up a complex exhibition and then keep it for six weeks, no? So that one, it's again la longue durée, you know, longer duration would be another aspect. And then another thing is, of course, that one can bundle, you know, transports. We did a, a retrospective of the Haitian French painter Hervé Telemac uh, in his 80s, and um, basically, Many, many of his works are in, in French museums and collections. So we decided not to have any loans from overseas, you know, not to have any loans from outside France, but just to bundle everything there is in France in one lorry. And, you know, and that, so that's lots of, lots of possibilities. Great. Thank you so much, Hans Ulrich, and thank you, uh, Anesso. That's all we've got time for today. And now we're going to actually go and see some art. Um, Kim is going to uh, tell us about the next part of the day.